All right, we got the webinar started and we'll go live on Facebook. All right, looks like we are live. So I will get our presentation shared. Thanks everybody for joining us for the October Tuesday talks. Anna and I are really excited about this. Um, we get a kick out of doing these every month, but the spooky stories are really fun. Um, a fun thing for us to talk about and share the history of some buildings that y'all are probably in um, a lot as you're in our downtown and checking out our downtown businesses. So something extra for everybody to think about next time they're in the downtown. For sure. We've also uh, got some celebration of Community Planning Month. So the planners get really excited in Georgetown about this time of year because it's our time to um, be able to celebrate the work that we do on behalf of the community. So we'll share some information about that as well. And also we'll get started with some really great resources. So as soon as I make sure we are broadcasting live. Are, I think we're alive. Great. Um, so welcome everybody. I'm Britton Bostick. I'm the downtown and historic planner for the city of Georgetown. Joining me is Ann Evans, uh, an important uh, kind of part of my work and also uh, a wonderful asset to our award-winning Georgetown Public Library. And not only assists our library customers, but she also uh, is a great research resource um, for our community. She knows a ton of stories and so it's so great that she's able to share those with us through our Tuesday talks. And Anne has some really fun stories to share with everybody today. We um, are excited, kind of a lot going on this month, and we wanted to get started by recapping some of that for y'all. If you have uh, any questions about what's going on at the library or want to see what's new, you can visit library.georgetown.org and get the latest. They are still celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month. So if you joined us at the start of September for our Tuesday Talks then, we celebrated Hispan National Hispanic Heritage Month. That celebration is ongoing through the middle of this month. Um, and so it's a September 15th through October 15th celebration. We're super excited about acknowledging and recognizing the contributions of the Hispanic members of our community and the great role that they play in Georgetown. So if you're familiar with the San Jose neighborhood, and also the TRG neighborhood. We talked quite a bit about that in our last talk, which you can catch online. But, and the library has other events coming up that people might wanna know about and, and participate in. And also this comes with some really beautiful artwork. So tell us more about what we're seeing. Yes, yeah, so right now we have two wonderful exhibits in the library. Um, the first that is only up through October is Art Hop 14. It's at the Art Center and the library. Um, there will be a reception this Saturday. It's kind of a moving reception. You get to kind of go around. You start off here at the library and then you move over to the art center. So please come join us for that. There's also fabulous art throughout the building um, that you can see from artists across Texas in a variety of mediums. So it's always a fun exhibit. And then we also currently have Let Me Be Myself, which is presented with uh, Congregation Havara Shalom of Sun City in the library. And this is on the second floor of the library. It's the life and story of Anne Frank. There are um, docents available to help answer questions most days that the library is open. If you have a larger group, you can go on the library website and uh, schedule a tour, or you can also just come in and kind of self-guide yourself if you're a smaller number and view this wonderful exhibit that we are so proud to be able to present that travels nationwide um, in celebration of Anne Frank's life and her legacy. So, we also have our annual genealogy lock-in coming up on October 15th. It's called Roots, Records, and Research. This is in conjunction with the Waco Genealogical Center and Library. Uh, and they organize speakers every year. This year, we're kind of doing a hybrid model. You can either attend virtually, and to do so, you do need to register because we need to be able to send you the links to the talks. And, or you can attend in person where we will stream the talks here at the library. 
Um, it does go from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. So it is a kind of an all day event. You can see the full schedule of events um, and speakers, see who you might like to attend on uh, the library website. You can also register at bit.ly slash GPL dash roots. And uh, we hope you'll be able to join us for those. There's always some fabulous speakers. They, again, nationally um, recognized speakers. They, I believe, have had attendees from all 50 states the last few years that they've done this um, virtually. So it's always a fun, a fun day and you get to learn a lot of things. It's from for the novice to kind of the expert. So there's a wide range of topics. And this sounds like great fun. Um, so if you uh, are not familiar with the history of planning or why Georgetown has an entire planning department, I'll get into more of this at the end of our presentation because I know we're all here for the spooky stories, but October is National Community Planning Month. And one of the fun ways that we uh, celebrate that more in February than in October, but they have some specialized Valentines just for planning and they're pretty nerdy. Um, and so things like my heart is zoned exclusively for you. This bike lane is built for two. Uh, things that planners find interesting, engaging and kind of fun. Um, that everybody else might go, what? What is this about? Um, but we do get so excited about our work. This is um, a career that, that so many of us are really passionate about because it's a way for us to serve our community um, professionally. And so we really, uh, in the planning department, love to be able to serve our community by helping answer questions about what people need to do to go through an application process or where they can find information. And also we are part of development review for the city. And so we see a lot of applications for new projects. We see applications for rehabilitation projects. And then because uh, I work in our historic district, especially, I get to see uh, the applications for the work that people are doing on their historic properties and get to assist people through the process. So if you have any questions about development review or what the application requirements are or what you would need to know um, about your project, you're welcome to contact us. Uh, we were planning.georgetown.org and we'll have some contact information toward the end. But Anne, you're going to start us off with our first stop on our spooky tour. And this is a building that I've talked about before. I really, really love, but it's a building that we don't have anymore. So we're going to show a picture of it. We'll show what's there now. If, if this is not a building that you think, I, where is that? I've never seen that because it hasn't been there for a while, but it's the reason that we've got a little bit of a ghost story uh, on a corner of our square. It is, so we're starting off at 7th and Main, and you can see it's kind of blocked there in the red. And we're gonna be talking a little bit about a building that's not there anymore, which is the International Order of the Odd Fellows Hall. So this two-story stone building, if that doesn't look familiar, it's because you probably have never seen it unless you've watched one of these Tuesday talks before. The International Order of the Odd Fellows was kind of a, like a similar to the Masons, um, they are still around. They were very large organization in Georgetown um, around the turn of the century. In fact, we one of the largest cemeteries in Georgetown, the International Order of the Odd Fellows or IOOF Cemetery is just down the street from where this building is. If you just kept going down um, 7th Street, it's back behind Southwestern. Um, and the Odd Fellows typically met up on the second story and they rented out the bottom story. And they rented the bottom story to a variety of different businesses and people. And one of the longstanding businesses in this building though was the Davis Furniture Store. And at times the Davis Funeral Home also occupied this building and this area. Um, which is perhaps why it is considered to be one of the most haunted corners in Georgetown, uh, haunted areas in Georgetown, um, because it does have a long history of being a funeral home. Also, the Davis family operated the ambulance for the Georgetown Hospital until the 1970s, because there were private ambulances. So most of the time, the funeral homes in a town or city were the ones that operated it because uh, they had a large enough vehicle. So there's not really any specific ghosts or hauntings that occur in here. Um, it's mostly people kind of following, uh, hearing someone follow them, hearing whispers, hearing talking, 
Uh, never any specific things happening, but lots of eerie vibes and eerie footsteps occur around this area um, from the time that this building existed into the time that it becomes the library for a while and into the time that it even becomes the uh, city council chambers for a while into what it is now, which is Tejas Meat Market. And you can see kind of what it looks like now. Although, uh, Britain, did you want to talk a little bit about the building itself? I have some questions about this. Um, yes. We focused a lot on the building itself, but when we were looking at this photo and, and talking about this story and, and the experience people had, there's some really interesting things out front and I'm just really curious what was going on in this day. We can see some, this is an early photo. Uh, we know this building was built around 1900, um, but there's kind of some wagons, horse-drawn uh, vehicles, but there's a hammock out front strung between the poles of the awning. And then there, it kind of looks like there's these big firms set up on these kind of ladder-like structures. Um, and then maybe what looks like a bit of a booth to the right of the building. So. It's just so interesting to me, some of the details that get captured. And so if you look at this building compared to what's there now, um, the similarities kind of end with the fact that both buildings had limestone facades. <laughs> yes, and window. windows. Windows and doors. Is, yeah, windows and doors. Um, it's on the corner and there's limestone. So this is a much shorter building. Um, I laugh a lot about the trees on the square getting in the way of my photos. Um, you so you can't see the buildings as well now that we have these great trees. We didn't always have these great trees, so it's good to appreciate them. Um, but if you, uh, if you do stop by Tejas Meat, uh, maybe keep an eye out over your shoulder uh, for, for somebody following you. <laughs> yes, keep an eye out. And also, because I know we tend to get this question a lot when we talk about the International Order of the Odd Fellows Hall, um, to our knowledge, no members of the Odd Fellows were in the walls of the Iowa building when it was taken down. This is a thing that has happened in the United States. <laughs> um, but to our knowledge, that did not occur in Georgetown. Um, so sorry to burst that bubble. That would be a great ghost kind of spooky story, but uh, it's just not true that we have any, any, anything to support that. So no, nobody was hiding in the walls when they took the building down. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> so now we're headed to the south side of the square. Um, we've really got a spooky story for just about every side today. Um, oh. And the south side is one that I get so interested in because the buildings on the south side, um, I think are just, they tend to be a little bit older in a lot of cases than some of the other sides of the square. Yes, so we're moving um, to 112 uh, West 8th Street, which is kind of smack dab in the middle there. You can see this kind of an early photograph. Uh, it was built around 1889, we're not really sure, um, but one of the first instances of people that we have that are owning it are Bascom Washington Landrum and F.A. Mood. They operated grocery there for a long time. Um, in fact, they actually had an ironclad grocery room at the rear of the building. I'm not really sure what that means. Um, there's no accounts of stealing. I, maybe, but there's also no accounts of any of the other grocery stores around the square having such a thing. They felt it was a big enough deal that they advertised it in the paper. Um, but again, didn't really tell us why that was a, a nice thing to have. Maybe it allowed for more temperature control over certain substances. I'm not really sure. Um, he, ba uh, Bascom arrived in Georgetown around 1890 in a covered wagon. He brought his children, including his one-year-old named Neely. Uh, they spent their first few nights in Georgetown in a wagon before uh, they ended up owning and operating this store, as well as several different businesses around the county. They actually owned and operated a laundry um, out in Taylor. Neely remembered growing up working in his store. Um, Neely actually goes on eventually to fight for the Calvary in World War I and then becomes kind of a hotel mogul out of Dallas. Um, he eventually gives like a substantial gift to help with the Oddfellows Cemetery and an improvements to it kind of going a full circle here. Uh, one of the things that people account in this building in particular is they'll be in the back area, kind of where that 
ironclad grocery room was. And they'll encounter a man. And then they come back out towards the front and ask what happened to the reenactor. Because they've seen someone that is so solidly solid in appearance and dress that looks like a cowboy that they assume that there has been a historic reenactor just wandering around the store with them. Um, and typically the people in the front are very confused and have no idea what they're talking about. Um, so that's one thing that happens. Another thing is several things will get moved around, hats and uh, canes in particular seem to be moved around doors lock, unlock, that type of thing. But perhaps my favorite thing that is related to buildings that once were buildings that are no longer here is that there are recordings that say, it's all gone, the building's all gone, and I missed the upstairs, which means it had to have been upstairs to this building even. Um, before we even have Sanborn maps, there's some accounts that perhaps there was a two-story wooden building here prior to the 1880s, but we're not really sure. Um, so it's just fascinating that uh, apparently whatever is uh, haunting in this area remembers the way things were about 150 years ago. Um, it was the Merle Norman for many, many years in the 80s in particular. This is the uh, Mikey V's directly pretty much looking at it from the, you're looking kind of from the courthouse on this photograph. And then, uh, yes, this fabulous office supply and jewelry prepare. This was uh, kind of right before uh, the Main Street program got going uh, in Georgetown. And we started with the downtown revitalization efforts that got us our beautiful square today. And so if you see the comparison, uh, I took this photo yesterday showing um, some of our newer businesses on the south side of the square, including Mikey V. So if you stop in for a taco, where you go get a taco in the back is about where that ironclad grocery room would have been. Uh, so think about that next time you stop in for a taco. And then um, the south side of the square is really interesting. I said, I thought it uh, kind of was a bit, a lot of the buildings were a bit older than the other sides. And so um, it seems like the ghost would agree. Um, but we have a building here on the corner, and I just caught it in this photo. Uh, it's Kilwins. They just opened, so if you haven't had a chance to stop by, that's a great opportunity to get into the McDougal building. They have a brand new storefront on the corner, and as we kind of skip down the street, that's where we're headed next. Another one of these uh, very prominent buildings on our square, um, and a little, a little bit older building uh, kind of in, in its origins. In its origins, yes. Um, and so McDougal actually arrived in Georgetown around 1869 with his mother um, and his siblings. And, and what's kind of funny about him is where you're not actually sure if he was born in 1839 or 1849, kind of dis disagrees, everything disagrees and there's no official record. Um, so we don't know if he lived to be 90 or 100, but he did live a long life. And he actually was one of those cowboys that went on a trail drive to Salina, Kansas from Georgetown, probably with the Snyder brothers, um, who were instrumental in helping establish Southwestern here in Georgetown. Um, they were also the big name in cattle in Georgetown for a long time. Um, so McDougal builds this building. Um, and operates a grocery store, again, another grocery store. No iron. Hi, and thanks for calling yeah. Georgetown okay. ISD. Please oh note gosh. that our regular business hours are from 7.30 a.m. Um, and so uh, he operates a business in there, a grocery store, for about 25 years or so. Um, again, it becomes a variety of different stores. When Level operates in there for a while, um, he actually becomes one of the first people to hire women as clerks in his store, which might explain this, this particular haunting. We really don't really have any other information about what happens here, but you see that staircase that is running up the side of the building. We're looking at this building here on the right. There goes into the second floor uh, doorway, but 
just to the right of that, there's another window. It is said that on Christmas Eve at midnight, there's a woman in red who will come to that window and wave until about uh, 12.05 on Christmas morning. Whoa. Again, we don't really know anything about what or who she might have been or where she might have come from. Um, again, we know that some of the first female clerks are working in this building uh, as a store employees on the Georgetown Square. We also know that McDougal becomes a pretty affluent member of Georgetown society and builds a beautiful home and has some wives or has, has a wife and some daughters. So might be any one of them. Um, could be just a completely different story altogether. You could make it your own. But that is what's happening in this building. Um, I just love this photograph because you can see the courthouse is under construction. So we have a very specific date for it. We know it must be around 1911 um, or maybe, maybe 1910, but odds are 1911. And I just like all the things that are going on. Like There's the guys like here the on the left hanging out of the window. So it looks like this photo was taken from what would have been the Makinson Hotel. Yes. Um, and he's kind of looking pretty precarious hanging out the window. There's also, it looks like um, a pretty substantial fence around the courthouse, which would have made sense. Uh, they kind of probably would have wanted to keep cattle out of the courthouse yard while they're trying to build the building. And then you can see these telephone or electric wires or both. I'm not totally sure which they are, but they have been newly strung. So you can see a lot of uh, kind of dirt being moved around the square. And then, Anne, you pointed out uh, in the background toward the left, there's a building and you can see another staircase up to it. It's got these arched windows on the second floor. Um, and that is an early picture of um, the Lockett building and kind of before some key features were added to it that we know it for today. Um, and I think that's our next stop on the tour. Is that right? It's our next stop on the tour. Although oh, we've got this great that, interior let's photo. Talk about the interior of the um, McDougal building. This is when the German Alliance insurance offices were in this building. Um, we unfortunately do not know the name of this man. I do like, again, that you can kind of see some of that electric, early electric uh, mechanisms and phone line going there on his desk in amidst the papers. Uh, you can also see some of the fabulous detail work that occurred in buildings all around the square, including that wonderful door and that looks like might be like peacock paper, wallpaper that's just outside the door in the hallway. It's great. Um, so just some of those details that we don't often get to see when we're talking about the exterior of the buildings and looking at them, um, as well as the things that we don't necessarily see today. That's true. Um, and so if you, um, they just redid the storefront on this building. So here it is before. And before we planted the great oak trees at the corner, which we enjoy the shade of today. Um, and remember up the stairs, uh, the window on the right is the window that the woman uh, appears in. I've not seen her, um, but you. if you're out and about around Christmas Eve, you might check and see if you can see the woman at the window. Um, that's kind of wild and interesting. Plus, um, Anne always brings some really great resources to share. And so we wanted to show, um, we've really gotten into these old newspapers, either uh, copies of the Sun or copies of other newspapers in Georgetown. And if you look at the bottom left corner, there's this great train and this is tied to our next ghost story uh, and the next building that we're gonna talk about. Yes, so I love these because just looking at this, you can tell so much about what was happening in Georgetown at that time. You can actually see a small advertisement for City Hotel, which probably would have been roughly where the Makemson building is, so where that man was hanging out the window um, in our photograph of the courthouse under construction. We've also got an advertisement for McDougal Grocery. It's very small. Um, and they are selling, I believe, pineapple, three pounds for 20 cents um, or something like that. And uh, if you click, I think it'll pop up. Um, there we go. Yeah. Three pounds for 20 cents of grated pineapple at McDougal and Booty, Booty, which if you're familiar with the Booty name is of course, Booty's Crossing, Booty's Road. Um, 
their family was all out in that area. And then they say to look at their show windows and make a selection of fancy groceries. And so I just really appreciate that advertisement versus the train in one, which is the locket buildings advertisement. People ask a lot why we had so many different dry goods stores around the square. And it really comes down to each one is kind of operating its own little thing. So you might have some things that are offered at several different dry goods stores, but you would also have things like more groceries at McDougal and Booty, maybe certain kinds of groceries at McDougal and Booty. And then at the Locket building, you have more in the way of clothing. And you can see he's kind of having to close out right now on uh, clothing. It's just this fabulous advertisement of cost sale here means cost. So advertisers don't really change. <laughs> there. Um, but if we move on, we'll go see the Locket building, which is there back on that north side of the square at 7th and Main. And I love this photograph of it. Again, people always seem surprised when you go down to the square and you see it just overrun with people. But this is not a new occurrence. It's been happening for a long time. Um, this might have been a first Monday event or something like that, where a bunch of people come into town to trade as kind of an organized activity. It might have also just been something else going on. We don't really know. But here in this photograph, you can see the locket building. And you can also see the wonderful uh, shade structures that so many buildings put up prior to the advent of air conditioning. Um, and the Locket Building itself was, we know stores of some sort or kind have operated in that area since the 1840s. Um, and then the Locket Building, you can kind of make out um, at the very top, it was built circa 19, 1896. So the building itself is built a little bit after, about half a century after storefronts have been operating there. Um, Lockett and his family actually owned it into the 1950s. So what's fascinating to me about this building in particular is that it's owned for long periods of time by certain families. In fact, there's only a few handful of families that have owned it over the years. And um, after Lockett's daughter buys out his, uh, her, her sister's, essentially in 1940s, she actually owned it for about a decade on her own. So we've talked a little bit about women in real estate on the square. There were a lot of women in real estate and owning the buildings on the square um, throughout its history. Um, at the Locket building, the ghosts are actually pretty considerate. They don't, unlike at Mikey V's, they don't really seem to bother customers or come out during the day. Um, they tend to keep their activities to closed hours. But they do tend to uh, kind of play with the staff, it seems like, a lot. Um, so they like to move chairs that have been stacked up on top of tables. They like to flicker lights. They like to go up and down that main staircase that is in the front of the building. Um, they also, apparently, some staff have reported that they've felt like different portraits or photographs in the building have been following them. Um, their eyes follow them around. So lots of things going on here in the Locket building, lots of activity. Um, I like to think that maybe it is one of those longtime families um, that's kind of just hanging out, keeping, keeping watch over their building into the future. And this is Melville and Annie Locket. They had five daughters. Such a great photo who married very well. Uh, three of their daughters actually married Southwestern professors, um, ended up staying in the Georgetown area um, or throughout Texas. And then as I mentioned, um, Melly Lockett, guess who she was probably named after, although it kind of sounds like her name is a, a mixture of Melville and Andy. So maybe it was a, a combo name there, um, actually ended up buying out her sister's shares of the Lockett building and owning and operating it for many years on her own. Funnily enough, uh, Lockett actually originally purchased the uh, 
store building in that store area from Captain Price. And again, just kind of tying back, Captain Price's home was one of the locations of the Davis Funeral Home for a while. So early Georgetown, it's all interrelated and interconnected. Um, a lot of the same families, you see the same names popping up and it can make it very difficult to understand at some points. But also it's kind of fun when you're like, oh, there's that connection there between these two things. And here it is today. So Good Folks is going in here shortly. They've got their new awnings and signs up. The building's got a paint color refresh. Um, it's really important to keep buildings painted. And so a spooky thing for me is when a building doesn't have its paint kept up and the wood uh, is a lot more subject to decay and deterioration um, if it's not got that protective layer of paint on it. So spooky means different things to different people. We've got some great ghost stories, but also important to keep your historic wood painted so that we don't have the spooky situation of having that wood deteriorate and need to be replaced. Um, so but it's looking really good and they should be opening shortly. So another spot for y'all to visit and just keep an eye out for anything that might be kind of uh, whizzing past you uh, or, or spying on you. We have some really great partners in Georgetown and wanted to share with y'all, if this wasn't enough spooky stories for you, there are more happening this month. So the Williamson Museum does uh, their annual ghost tours in the month of October. Those are going on now. You can check out their website to buy tickets. So you can visit williamsonmuseum.org slash ghost dash tours, and you can buy tickets and see what times are available there. They usually do those on weekend evenings, and that is a really, really popular tour. So if you're interested, I recommend getting tickets ASAP, um, and they're happy to help you out through their website, or you can contact the museum directly if you have any questions about that. But I've heard really good things and their volunteers who give the tours are just absolutely fantastic at sharing and conveying those stories um, in character. So we wanted to close by sharing a little bit about the history of planning in Georgetown. This may surprise you. Um, it certainly surprised me when I found this out. I was looking for an original newspaper article that I had seen, couldn't find it. So um, I can't be blaming ghosts for that. It's probably my own fault, but what I do know is um, the Eubank family, Cyrus Eubank, had intended to build a house really close to the square in 1884. And he was in what they called the fire zone at the time. So you have to remember that back in 1884, and this map that I'm showing on the left side of the screen is from 1885, every yellow building that you see on that map was made out of wood. And we didn't light things by electricity at that point in time. We lit by kerosene or candle. And so you have fire and you have wood buildings and it was a literal recipe for disaster. So they tried to very carefully manage fire risk um, even earlier on in Georgetown's history. And one of the ways that the city council did that was to establish a fire district was, which was about two or three blocks around the courthouse square. And you had to apparently go before council uh, for certain buildings and get kind of special permission to build. So Cyrus Eubank went to council in 1884 and said, I wanna build this two-story wood house on this property that I own. And it was at the corner of, I believe, Main Street and 10th Street. And the city council denied him his permit. And they said, no, you can't build it, this, this wood house there. And uh, it appears that he was kind of aggrieved uh, by this decision. He went back two years later and then did get the permission. Um, and then we can see here in the newspaper that Mr. C. Eubank is having a two-story residence erected at his place on Main Street on the third block from the square. So it's more of kind of a, maybe considered more of a building permit issue, but there were some key things that contributed to cities getting into the planning business and getting into having building codes and zoning codes and, and particular things about how people built and where. One of them was fire risk and being able to assess, evaluate, and manage that risk successfully, which, like I said, went back to the 1800s because downtowns would catch on fire. You've heard of the Great Chicago Fire. You've heard of the Great San Francisco Fire. Those happened around the turn of the 20th century, but towns were catching on fire for railroad sparks, cigarettes, kerosene lamps turning over. Any number of accidents could happen and put a town at risk, and so this was to mitigate that. 
But um, planning really took off nationally around the turn of the 20th century. And about the time that we're seeing those great fires and kind of big disasters that were um, either uh, damaging property or putting lives at risk or, or kind of um, accidental death that occurred from that. So Hartford, Connecticut was actually the first city in the US with an official and permanent planning commission that happened in 1907. Harvard had the first planning course in college in 1909. The Burnham plan for the city of Chicago was the first city master plan in 1909. So you had to do something after the big Chicago fire. Early zoning happened in 1913 in New York, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Illinois. Uh, we still were a little bit too much of a cowboy Wild West town um, for planning officially in 1913, but we were catching up. The first municipal planner, so basically the first city planner, uh, was Harlan Bartholomew, and there's another really good name for you, in mm -hmm. 1914. And that was in the city of Newark, New Jersey. And then the Standard State Zoning Enabling Act happened in 1922. In Georgetown, though, um, we started adding property to the city, uh, kind of created the city in 1849, and then started adding subdivisions to it shortly thereafter. But by 1915, the map that you're looking at, this is the city of Georgetown. So our historic neighborhoods, the downtown district, the old town district, the TRG neighborhood, the San Jose neighborhood had not quite come along by this point, but it's just south of this map that you see. Those historic neighborhoods were really all of Georgetown uh, in just after the turn of the century. And so turn of the 20th century. And so you can kind of see all of that laid out here. And I'm pointing out where the historic courthouse is. So it wasn't right in the center of town. It was a little bit to the Northwest and then town kind of spread out between the river and Southwestern and then South basically to where the kind of the bottom of the railroad uh, tied in. By 1965, Georgetown had not grown a lot. So in that 50 year period, we were still a pretty small city. So when Anne talks about same families and a lot of interconnectedness, well, there weren't a lot of people and town wasn't very big. So we're still seeing between the river and Southwestern, but 1965, we start to have subdivisions developing out uh, on Williams Drive. And then we also start to be, see the very first subdivision off Leander Road. So if you live in either of those areas or if you're familiar with those areas, that happened right after the interstate went in in 64. And then currently, uh, I've got a blue circle around our planning map. This shows the city of Georgetown. All the colorful parcels are the city limits. And that big gray line shows our extra extraterritorial jurisdiction, or e ETJ that we call it. So you can see Georgetown has grown a lot since 1965. And even though our initial growth was to the south and east, our recent growth has really been a lot to the north and west going out Williams Drive and out toward the lake. So you can see Lake Georgetown encompassed in our city limits. That's a great recreational area and our Parks and Rec Department does an awesome job managing some of the sites and facilities um, in conjunction with the Corps of Engineers and some other uh, kind of uh, organizations that help manage that asset for us. So you can see uh, Georgetown is, is getting bigger and we have some room to grow still. So we're really happy to answer those questions at the planning department. You can check out historic.georgetown.org. That's where we post Tuesday talks. That's where the Zoom link lives. If you're interested in more Tuesday talks, and Anne, I was looking for it. I'm just going to start blaming ghosts for when I can't find any things, um, especially this month. But That's fair. You're in, a, you're in a very historic building. I'm in a very historic building. Uh, I don't have any ghost sightings to report, unfortunately, um, but I'll keep an eye out. But I was looking for, I think we did a Tuesday talk sharing some other haunted uh, buildings and I can't find which one it was. But if you'll go to historic.georgetown.org, you can find a link to our certified local government program. And that's the page that we keep the recordings of our Tuesday talks on if you wanna look up those extra recordings. And then the planning department website is planning.georgetown.org. We have a lot of information about development requirements and applications. You can also call us at 512 nine three zero three five seven five or stop by and see us we're right across the city hall from city hall at 809 martin luther king jr street and then ann is right next door to me to the east with the georgetown public library so we're kind of all lined up here to help if you are interested or need to look at building permit requirements then you can go to permits.georgetown.org our building inspections department is a separate department from the planning department 
and they're in a separate building in the city, um, but we're both here to help. So if you need permit information, please feel free to check them out and see what those requirements are. And you can also contact them for assistance and they've got their contact info on their website. So Anne, thanks so much for some great stories. We are wrapping up a little bit early today, which is great. Um, everybody's got a little extra time for their lunch. But if we have any questions, this would be a great time to share those questions. You can drop those in the chat, or we also can, uh, we're happy to take questions at historic at georgetown.org. That's our email. And then you can call us, I'm at 512-930-3581. And then Anne is at 512-930-6614. And so um, we've had some really great follow-up from folks who have uh, had more information to share with us after we give a presentation and they'll either call or email us and share that additional information. Or sometimes people have follow-up questions or they're looking for some more information or it might be as simple as, hey, I remember that you said the Williamson Museum was giving ghost tours. How do I get connected with them? How do I get tickets? And you can use either those email or phone number uh, contacts for us to help you with that information. So, and it's been great as always. Anything else we need everybody to know as we head off into our spooky season, um, which doubles as community planning season. <laughs> No, yes, as, as many things. Um, I wanted to share that Keith Hutchison mentioned, thanks for mentioning Cyrus Eubank in our house. Uh, so we do have a, a Tuesday talk kind of dedicated to that house as well. We do. Yes, so if you want to learn more about that particular house that was denied its uh, original location um, or originally there, you can it's moved, it's changed, it's gone through a whole history of its own. You can also view that Tuesday talk to learn a little bit more about the way some of the downtown historic homes have changed over the last century. That was a really fun one. So that was our first moved house mystery. Um, we have some relocated houses in Georgetown that we um, occasionally need to try to figure out where they came from. And it turns out that the Cyrus Eubank house that I showed the newspaper article he was building, that house got moved to another part of Old Town. It got cut in half and put on two separate lots as two separate houses. So the downstairs is one house and the upstairs is one house. And we did a whole talk about it. We were joined by Liz Weaver, who's the historian for Preservation Georgetown, another really great partner of ours. So um, speaking of Preservation Georgetown, they have Grace Heritage Chapel open. It's on Main Street, um, kind of right at the corner of Main and Ninth. And so if you're interested in seeing the inside of that church, that's an 1880s era church. It's one of the oldest church structures in Georgetown. And uh, it's a beautiful little white church that you might recognize it next to Port Wine Bar across from the Georgetown Art Center. Preservation Georgetown is there um, on Saturday mornings, especially. Um, and you can go inside and have a look at that beautiful building. There's a lot of interior features that are still intact from that. We did a whole moved uh, building uh, kind of episode awesome. or included that in an episode <laughs> and showed how that got trucked from one part of the city down to downtown um, and very close, not its original location, but very close to its original location. So with all this moving and shaking about, um, it's no wonder sometimes the ghosts get a little bit shook up and, uh, and come haunting. <laughs> come haunting, yes. Yeah. Um. All right, I don't see any other questions. So thanks so much for that, Keith. We really appreciate you watching and also stewarding a wonderful historic asset of ours. And so we will see everybody next month with a new topic. We'll do our Tuesday talks the first Tuesday in November from 12 to one. We do this on Zoom and we also go live on Facebook. And then uh, we've got recordings of our videos on, you can also, uh, you can catch them on our website on historic.georgetown.org, but you can also catch them on the city's Facebook page. And so that's another uh, useful place, as long as Facebook is working. So I guess the ghosts knew that we were going to kind of tell their stories and got into Facebook yesterday. Um, and I'm just going to blame this for the rest of the month. So y'all look out. I'm going to be blaming ghosts for everything. Everything. I think it's fair. <laughs> Thanks so much, Anna. I really appreciate you, you giving us some great information and a, and a ghostly tour of our square. So y'all take care and we'll see you next month. Month. <laughs>